All right, we are live and people are filtering in. All right, well, welcome everyone to the North Sonoma Valley Municipal Advisory Council. And um, thank you to members of the public and community organizations in the press and the council members who are here for your participation. And uh, unfortunately, um, Susan Gordon won't be able to attend this meeting. And I also uh, need to announce that Melissa Dowling, who's served on the council since September, um, has decided to resign, um, <clears throat> largely, I think, because of her duties at the Kenwood Press. But the good news is, is that she's still available to work with us uh, getting out news about the Mac. So we'll still have that good media connection. Um, and also, um, um, <clears throat> Let's see, Vicki Vicky Handron isn't here tonight, and Matt Dickey also uh, was unable to make it. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't call the meeting to order. I'm calling the meeting to order, and please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And I think Ariel's got the flag, maybe. All right, join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance yes. to the flag. flag. Of the, United of the United States, States of America, America. America. and to the, and to the Republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. All right, thanks everyone. And uh, <clears throat> Vice Chair Doss, would you please call the roll for us? Sure, Chair Dawson. Um, uh, Chair uh, Arthur Dawson. Here. Member, uh, Council Member Kate Eagles. Here. Council Member Mark Newhauser. Here. Council Member Angela Nardo Morgan. Here. Council Member Jed Cooper. Here. And we've already noted the three that aren't here with us uh, today. Right. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair Das. Um, so just a couple of uh, short announcements. Um, so uh, the question and answer and chat are turned off for the meeting. And when public comment is opened, um, you can use the raise hand function on Zoom uh, to be promoted to speak. Or um, if you want, you can wave your hand in front of the screen, which is what I like to do. And, and <laughs> we should see you and, and uh, we'll call on you. Um, <clears throat> uh, if it looks like the meeting's been hacked at any point, we will close down the meeting and uh, reschedule at a future date. Hopefully that won't happen. Um, all right, well, I just have, like to make a few, say a few things in the beginning. Uh, these will be a little bit longer than I've been in the past possibly, but uh, we have a, a busy meeting ahead and I wanna make sure um, that we're sort of ready, ready to uh, go. But um, for those of you who are with us for the first time, the North Valley Municipal Advisory Council serves the communities of Eldridge, Glen Allen and Kenwood. As the most local arm of county government, we represent people who live and work outside the incorporated cities of places like Sonoma and Santa Rosa. We are in a sense, a country town council. Like other advisory councils in Sonoma County, we were established by the Board of Supervisors to act as a two-way communication channel. The MAC serves as our community voice at county government as a means for us to learn about and access county resources and as a place to identify challenges and opportunities and innovate solutions in partnership with our supervisor. Our bylaws limit us to issues concerning transportation, health and human safety, community projects, and emergency preparedness. Other topics can be added at the request of our supervisor. While we do not have land use purview, uh, which is covered by the Sonoma Valley Citizens Advisory Council, we will be hearing from Permits Sonoma later this evening about the rezoning environmental impact review, which will impact two properties in downtown Glen Ellen. While the MAC cannot vote on this, I encourage people to comment tonight and also to make public comments tomorrow at the Planning Commission meeting at 1 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, the, the link is available at the county uh, or by email until June 18th. Um, Let's see, and then we have an, an amendment to the agenda. Um, item five should be renamed rezoning sites for housing environmental impact report overview instead of the scatter, scattered housing rezoning environmental impact review. So it should be rezoning sites for housing. Um, our name change to the North Sonoma Valley MAC uh, will be on June 8th. 
So our next meeting, that will be official. And I'd also like to introduce um, our new minute taker, Alyssa Condor, who has worked for the county taking minutes in the past. And uh, also Hannah Whitman, who is helping with our MAC tonight. And we'll be tr transitioning to lead staff <clears throat> for Supervisor Gorin's office for the MAC over the next few months. Um, and if you have any communications as part of your ad hoc, uh, please loop them in and uh, don't reach out directly to county staff, but go through uh, the supervisor's office. Okay. Um, sorry, got lots of pieces of paper here. Um, all right, we, so our first item is, um, is approval of the minutes from uh, last month. And I, do I have a, uh, any, anybody have any uh, changes or um, additions to the minutes from last month? Okay, do I hear um, a move to uh, approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Okay, and do we have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor of approving the minutes from last month, uh, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, approval of the minutes um, was passed unanimously. <clears throat> so, um, we're gonna to go to public comments now. Um, so if anyone, and we don't have too many people yet, so we Sarah may not Dawson, have any. Can I have a, ask the clarifying question before we yeah. go to public comments? So uh -huh. you mentioned that Hannah is starting, Alyssa's taking notes. Thank you both, welcome. Um, can you just clarify, do we still loop in you, Ariel, to communications or is Hannah taking that on for, for yeah. you and you're moving? Can you clarify? Yeah, no problem. So tonight, um, this is Hannah's first time stepping into that role. So tonight she's going to be doing the public comment. So she's going to be um, calling on people and, and doing that. Um, it will be a slow transition. So please do continue to loop me in. Um, you know, I'm not going to just throw her to the wolves next month and have her run the whole thing. So, so we're going to be doing it together um, until, you know, we, we transition it that way. Um, but I think she's going to be taking on more of a role. So I think I'm ne next I might have her make the agenda and all, um, you know, but uh, yes, please do continue to loop me in. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So um, we'll, we'll take a show of hands from anyone in the public who wishes to speak on matters that are not on the agenda. So um, if you are here to, to comment on the rezoning, please wait till after the permit, permit Sonoma uh, presentation uh, later on. Uh, in the program. Um, and when you're called on to speak, uh, you have two minutes and there will be a timer. Um, and it just allows us uh, to keep the meeting uh, at a reasonable length. So um, we're, we're gonna shoot for two hours again. If we get much past two hours, then um, we'll take a vote and see if people wanna take a short break and then come back. Um, but that's the goal is to, to do this in two hours. Uh, it's a ambitious this month, especially, I think. Okay, uh, Hannah, do we have any uh, members of the public that would like to speak? All right, thank you, Chair Dawson. So at this time we have three hands raised. So I'll ask Ariel to bring up the timer slide. All right, so for our first speaker is Tracy and you should be able to unmute and you will have two minutes. Okay. Um, Hi, you guys. Uh, so I'm here speaking as a board member for Sonoma Mountain Preservation. And um, what I wanna do is just bring to your attention and to the attention of anybody else who might be listening, um, the fact that there are um, guidelines protecting our ridgeline vistas um, that Sonoma Mountain Preservation has put together. And they're, um, there are guidelines that have been applied to the Mayakamas and also to Taylor Mountain now. Um, they're really good. They basically keep lights and um, bright objects like white homes from appearing on our skylines. Uh, and so that's basically why I'm here. Our mountain backdrops help define who we are and, um, and our place here in Glen Ellen. And, uh, yeah, just want you guys to be aware of them and encourage you to support them and encourage Permit Sonoma and um, 
other county officials to support them. And that's really all I've got to say. All right, thank you, Tracy. And we'll take um, uh, council member comments will come after the public comments. Okay, right. who's next? Our next commenter is Alice. You should now be able to unmute and you'll have two minutes. Yeah. Welcome, Alice. So um, last month, I mentioned that I was really concerned about vegetation management in the field between Carmel Drive, Carmel Avenue and the regional park. It's a five acre field. And so I'm really happy to report that the owners have been super responsive. Um, they met with my firefighter neighbor and he walked all around with them and told them what they need to do. And they are meeting with Ellie Inslee this Friday as well to walk the property so that they get a really good understanding of, you know, ecologically what needs to happen and what shouldn't happen. And um, anyway, it's just been really good. I'm, I'm just so happy that they've been really responsive. They're going to do the work next week. It'll take a couple of days. And I know, you know, so many people walk through there and the town just kind of thinks of it as, uh, you know, our meadow. Um, but I'm really happy that this private property owner is doing that. And um, it's been a cool community project as well, because, you know, we've been communicating with all the neighbors on Carmel and on Yale, and it's given me an opportunity to push out a lot of information about house hardening and um, landscape stuff and defensible space and blah, blah, blah. And everybody's like, rah, rah. And so anyway, I am happy and this is good. <clears throat> and that's that. That's great. Thank you, Alice. You're welcome. All right, so our next speaker is Lori. Lori, you should now be able to unmute. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Arthur. Um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to follow up on uh, what Tracy was talking about, about the skyline and the lights up on Sonoma Mountain. And I, I'm the chair of the forums, Glen Ellen Forums Projects Committee, and we support the idea of the dark skies concept. We've made posters and suggested ways that people could decrease nightlight and we support any initiative that allows our rural skies to remain lit only with stars and the moon. That's it. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other um, members of the public who would like to speak? Chair <clears throat> Dawson, it looks like we have one more hand raised. So okay. uh, Stephen, you're our next um, speaker and you should now be able to unmute. All right, welcome Stephen. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Stephen Sorkin, the owner and developer of 13647 Arnold. I just wanted to give you a brief update on my project since we're going to be opening up pretty soon. The building is fully leased. We have most of the residential tenants in the building. We've uh, provided two capital A affordable units that went to prevent homelessness in vulnerable populations. More than half of the tenants in the building uh, work within Glen Ellen. My goal from the very beginning was to build a beautiful building that would provide high quality housing in a location served by transit in walking distance to a grocery store and the post office. And I think we've done that. The commercial tenants, uh, Jasmine with the Garden Court Cafe and Sherry with McCormick's Mercantile are finishing up inside and will be ready to greet the public shortly. I'm also really fortunate that the state ADU law has enabled me to replace the surface parking lot up by Railroad Street with two more dwelling units as a ministerially approved project in a manner that's consistent with the objective design criteria laid out by the county. We hope to start construction on those shortly. All right, thank you, Stephen. All right, and Chair Dawson, I don't see any additional hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, so now uh, we have an opportunity for um, council member comments on the public comments or response. Yeah, council member Eagles. Thank you, Chair Dawson. I have one question, Tracy, you may have said this, but where do the Ridgeline guidelines live at the moment? Where are they housed? Well, I don't know if Tracy can answer that. I guess we have to unmute. Uh, 
I can answer that. Um, oh, thank you. I yeah. Believe because um, I have a brochure here from some of Mountain Preservation about about that. Um, and what's the? I think if you go on the county website, you should be able to find it. Uh, it's the Taylor slash Sonoma slash Myakamas design guidelines. Um, okay, so should, if we're on the county site, that would be. Yeah, that could, and here's, yeah. here's the section number just in case it's hard to find, 26-90-050. Uh, Thank you. So and there are, there are uh, some ideas in, uh, in the guidelines about ways to reduce uh, light pollution if, if you have a house on the mountain. So I encourage any mountain homeowners to take a look at that and, and make sure you're in compliance. Um, any other um, comments or, or uh, questions from council members? Yeah, council member Nardo Morgan. Um, Tracy, I want to thank you for bring, and Lori for bringing this to our attention. I think it's really valuable, not just for for us, but for wildlife, and I, I fully support it, and I hope the community supports it. I have a quick question um, or two. One is, these are guidelines. Uh, are there any fines associated with this, or mostly just a guideline? And also, um, does this in any way affect things like Broadway Under the Stars, which I know is kind of a seasonal thing? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at answering that. Just uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm also on some of that preservation, and, and it's, I don't believe there are any fines associated with uh, the guidelines. They're supposed to be implemented when people are building on the mountain, um, but I don't believe there's any fines. And I, I haven't heard of uh, anyone concerned about um, with the guidelines under Broadway Under the Stars, but I'm not sure you could you could look into that. Thank you. I'll also add that we are going to, we have permits in Oma here tonight in a limited capacity, but they are going to be coming in July for a more comprehensive presentation. So um, I, I have asked them to cover that, um, the, the design guidelines as well. So oh, great. Um, hopefully we can have a, a, a conversation about that in July. Okay, great. Any other comments from council members? Okay. Um, so normally, um, this would be when Supervisor Gorman would give an update, but since she's not here, uh, Ariel's going to fill in and let us know what happened at the Tuesday board meeting. Yeah, um, so I'm going to be really, really brief um, on this, but uh, there was two um, major items up at this Tuesday's board meeting. Um, one was the cannabis, cannabis ordinance update. Um, and the other was the tree preservation ordinance workshop. So um, in case you haven't seen the papers, uh, the board decided not to um, update the cannabis ordinance and instead to pursue a full EIR. Um, so uh, that made a, a lot of folks pretty happy who um, had been advocating for that. And they also committed to doing um, you know, some really robust public outreach about this, as well as upstaffing Permit Sonoma to be able to, to handle um, continuing to permit things that are already in the pipeline, um, as well as to do the community outreach. Um, and I, I think that will be fairly robust. And I know uh, Chair Hopkins was very enthusiastic about at least, at least having some in-person style meetings that allow a little more of a dialogue um, amongst people. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, also, the tree, um, the tree preservation ordinance workshop um, essentially is going to be coming back in October. Um, there are a lot of kind of piecemeal tree ordinances and rules and guidelines around the county. And so they're going to take time to study um, and, and pull them all together to be looked at. Um, and uh, so, so that's, that's what's happening with that. So stay tuned on both of those. And I do want to highlight coming up next Tuesdays at the board meeting, um, Supervisor Gorin uh, will not be there. I think she is going to try to pop in for a couple items, but um, the pavement preservation um, project, when we had a TPW in here to talk about, you know, what they do and the tier two um, PG&E funding. So that included the undergrounding in, in Glen Allen and a couple other uh, items that we talked about at the MAC. That's going before the board for discussion on an approval on Tuesday. Um, and they're also going to have a COVID update. Um, and I believe in the COVID update, they're going to talk about 
some of the environmental health fees. Um, that has been an issue where folks uh, who own restaurants in the lake had to pay their, their regular permit fees, um, but they weren't allowed to be open. So I think there's some effort to kind of mitigate that or at least discuss it. Um, so that's the preview for next week as well. And I will try my best to answer any questions you may have, but I am not the supervisor, so I may not be as, as knowledgeable. Hey, Ariel. Yeah, any questions for Ariel or? I have one question um, for the tree ordinance. Is there a way to provide uh, written comments? I didn't make it to the workshop and maybe I'll make it in October, but if I don't. Definitely, yeah. Um, I know who the planner is that's working on it. So um, I, I'll also follow up um, and see uh, if there is kind of a, I know for cannabis, there's cannabis at sonoma-county.org and, and they do read those and compile them. So I don't know if there's a tree ordinance um, you know, email uh, like that one, but that, that's a great suggestion. And, and in, the, in the meantime, you can always just send them to me and I can, um, if, if you want, until I get an update for you and I can make sure they get to the right place. Okay, is there a document already created that's like a draft? Yeah, so the, uh, from the meeting materials, um, it's, it's probably down right now just because when they, they do the board meeting, then everything needs to come down so they can repost the recording um, ADA compliant, but it should be up tomorrow or by Friday. Um, and you can go review the video as well as um, review all the, the, the documents. Okay, great, thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? All right, well, moving right along here. Um, so now I'd like to, um, we're gonna move on to the um, presentation by Permit Sonoma. Uh, we have Nina Bellucci here from Permit Sonoma, and she's gonna tell us about um, the uh, draft EIR um, rezoning sites for housing. I think that's the correct uh, way to say it. Um, sorry, we had had a uh, change here that I didn't quite get in my notes. Um, but uh, so we're gonna have, hear from her and then I'll then have questions and comments from council members and also uh, questions and comments from the public. Um, and um, let's see, I guess, okay, yeah. So I will, I do have a comment from uh, someone who's not here, member of the public, but I'll uh, read that uh, after we hear from uh, Nina Bellucci. All right, is Nina on deck? I am, I'm here. Hi, Nina, welcome. Hi, thank you, Chair Dawson. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so give me just a second. Um, I'm juggling multiple screens. But this hasn't gotten easier after a year, has it? <laughs> Looking forward to getting getting Very back in person these days. Um, thank you. Yeah, one of these days. And you can see my screen, yes? Yeah. Okay, and I'm starting in the middle. Now, um, please tell me honestly, can you see my notes or can you see my presentation? Um, I'm seeing the title slide right now with no notes. No notes. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. That would be no fun for anybody to read. <laughs> or watch. Okay, thank you so much, all of you, for your patience. Thank you, Chair Dawson, um, council members, for having me uh, present this project. Um, this is the rezoning sites for housing program. Um, the, uh, oops, in simple terms, um, the project would rezone up to 59 sites in urban areas around the county with the goal of facilitating by right housing. Uh, at medium densities. 
if implemented, if all 59 sites were rezoned, it could accommodate up to 300, I'm sorry, 3,329 additional housing units. Um, it's actually an increase of uh, just under 3,000 because many of the sites do allow housing as of, uh, as of now, just not at these densities. The, um, one of the goals of the program is to potentially add sites to the county's housing element site inventory, which I will describe in a little more detail and put in context um, with the overall housing element update. Sites were located in 11 of the county's urban service areas, and the ones that we'll be talking about tonight are uh, two parcels in Glen Ellen. This project started uh, about two years ago after the, um, after the fires, there was a series of housing initiatives that we branded housing initiative as phase one and two. Originally, this was conceived of as phase three. Um, we have a, a, a lot of um, interest around the community and people who had property um, that they thought might be able to accommodate housing, uh, wanting to help, wanting to offer their property for development. And so this effort kind of grew out of that. We got over 200 sites nominated by property owners or possibly neighbors, people who saw our neighborhoods or maybe on their commutes that they thought were appropriate. And from that almost 200 sites, we whittled down 59 sites that were eligible for further analysis. And those sites are what's included in this uh, draft environmental impact report. It was determined that, that um, about a year or so ago, this project really um, got going that an environmental impact report was going to be required. So uh, in the middle of 2019, we got some state funding to assist with um, uh, in the preparing draft environmental impact report, selected a consultant, and then almost exactly a year ago, we um, issued the notice of preparation, which began the process of preparing the draft EIR. Uh, we published the draft in the middle of April, and um, it's now uh, beginning a 60-day public review period. So we're in that public review period right now. And this project is part of the housing element update. As I mentioned, it started um, a couple of years ago, and throughout that time, the housing element update, uh, the, the time to start that update has been looming. So. Um, we're in the kind of scoping period of the housing element update. We haven't really um, began any um, official outreach or, or started that process, but we are on a timeline. Um, housing elements have to be updated by the end of 2022. And so I just wanna give a, a couple of basics about the housing element and the regional housing needs allocation that it is uh, largely based on to give some context to this project. The housing element is a required element of the general plan and it's updated on an eight year cycle. Um, most general plan elements are updated on a much longer cycle, timeline than that. And all Sonoma County jurisdictions are on that same schedule. So we're all in, this, in the same boat. We're all updating our housing elements now. Um, the California Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, uh, certifies all housing elements. So that's another unique requirement that other general plan um, elements aren't subject to. And there are pretty severe consequences for not having a, a certified housing elements, including not qualifying for many state funds. So it's very important that we uh, have a certified housing element and are on time with it. Uh, so housing elements include um, a needs assessment, policies and programs to address that need, and a site inventory, which shows that there is enough land in the community available to meet that need. The number of new homes that jurisdictions have to plan for is called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or the RENA, and it's assigned on a regional basis by, uh, the, by HCD. And then HCD, uh, I'm sorry, so that number is uh, over 440,000 new homes that the Bay Area has to plan for. Uh, within that number, the regional planning bodies, in this case, the Association of Bay Area Governments and a housing methodology committee establish the requirements for each jurisdiction. So within Sonoma County, the, the county and the cities have to plan for over 14,000 new homes. Sonoma County, unincorporated Sonoma County's share is 3,881. 
which is almost eight times the number that we had to plan for in the last cycle. And that number was only 550. Uh, those are draft numbers. Um, the ABAG executive committee will vote on those numbers and make them final by the end of the year after all appeals are considered. And I did want to mention that within those, those total numbers, there are different levels that, uh, of income categories that we have to meet. So you have to plan for, all, for housing for a range of income levels and about half of the region's total are required to be affordable. So as I mentioned, the site inventory is the way that we show HCD that we have enough land to meet our need. And as the number of new homes that we have to plan for gets larger, new rules really constrain the number of available sites. Sites have to be available with realistic potential for development. And there's even stricter criteria for sites to count as affordably or to meet our affordable requirements related to the size of the site, vacancy and other requirements. There are also laws that require us to have adequate sites at all times during the planning period. So um, we really need an excess of sites to account for sites that become unavailable or develop at lower densities. So we're here to talk about these uh, two Glen Ellen par two parcels in Glen Ellen. This is uh, at the corner of Arnold and Carquinos. And um, these are, uh, this is the, some site characteristics, existing zoning, potential new zoning. Existing zoning or current zoning is uh, limited commercial with some combining zones that refer to our scenic resources requirements and the Glen Ellen development and design guidelines. And it was, these two parcels were analyzed for the addition of a workforce housing combining zone. A combining zone is um, an overlay zone that's, that's applied on top of the site's base zoning. So it doesn't change the underlying zoning uh, of the site or the underlying allowed land uses. It only adds the ability to um, build housing on commercial, some commercial or industrial sites. And the housing that the workforce housing zone allows is uh, at 16 to 24 units per acre. So this was analyzed at 24 units per acre for the purposes of the EIR, but that's not required. The criteria for the workforce housing combining zone includes proximity to jobs or transit. And in the case of these sites, they qualified based on their proximity to commercial land uses. And there's no development proposed on these sites at this time or on any sites in this project. The EIR analyzed the impact of uh, potential rezoning, not of any particular development. And if development were to occur, it would be subject to all the normal processes, including design review, and it would be subject to the Glen Ellen development and design guidelines. There is a, a draft, I think um, the chair mentioned the planning commission hearing tomorrow afternoon, and that is a public hearing to take comment on the draft EIR. I just wanna make very clear, this presentation is not that presentation. This is just an informational item and no decision will be taken on this item uh, either today or tomorrow at the Planning Commission. Certification of the final EIR will be considered by the board likely in early 2022. Um, as I mentioned, uh, so this EIR only looked at the impact of rezoning and it contains extensive mitigation measures to reduce those impacts, but there were significant and unavoidable impacts found in the areas of cultural resources, transportation and wildfire. With regard to transportation, this project is one of the first projects of this scale in this county to be evaluated under um, or using the vehicle miles travel metric. So it used to be that projects were evaluated based on the level of service, which related more to congestion. Vehicle miles traveled has more to do with or entirely to do with the, the number of miles of travel that a project might generate. And the threshold for that is that it has to reduce, the project would have to reduce the vehicle miles traveled below a certain threshold. And this project does actually reduce vehicle miles traveled, it's just not below the threshold and therefore it has to be found to be significant. 
So it doesn't increase VMT, but it doesn't reduce it enough to be found um, less than significant. And wildfire um, is relevant to these sites in that Glen Ellen is in a moderate fire hazard severity zone. And so wildfire impacts are, um, are relevant to those sites. Um, whereas some sites that aren't in fire hazard severity zones, those might not be as, as relevant. So um, we haven't developed recommendations to any decision makers yet. That's kind of, uh, that's sort of our next step along with a public outreach campaign that will include um, presenting to citizens and municipal advisory committees uh, or councils or <laughs> There's a many permutations of, uh, of those names. Um, we've already presented to most of them once. The ones that have uh, land use jurisdiction will go back and, and get their recommendations. We'll be doing additional outreach to property owners, residents and tenants, adjacent property owners, communities, stakeholder groups. Um, and then that will all, that along with the findings in the draft EIR will inform our recommendations to the planning commission and the board. Once the uh, public review period is over, um, all comments received will be reviewed and responded to accordingly. Those that raise significant uh, CEQA issues will be responded to in the final EIR. And we expect to present the project in the fall uh, to the Planning Commission and early next year to the Board of Supervisors. At that time, they'll consider the rezoning project and certification of the final EIR. Um, no decision will be taken until after public outreach and, um, and after uh, those two decision makers review the project. So that concludes my presentation. This is the project uh, website where all interested parties can download the EIR and review it. And um, there's instructions on how to submit comments on that page. Um, the uh, notice of availability also has more information about the project, submitting comments, and is also the notice of public hearing. So um, information on the public hearing and instructions on how to join can be found on the planning agency webpage. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that um, the council has. I'm going to unshare my screens so that everybody can see each other, but if you do want me to put up a map or um, that street view image of the sites or anything else, I can I can do that. So. All right, thank you, uh, Nidhi Bellucci. And um, any comments or questions from council members? Uh, I'm guessing other people are going to have some questions, but let me, let me just ask one uh, that, that um, it mentioned uh, proximity to commercial land uses. Uh, what, what commercial land uses were considered to be within that zone? I can't tell you um, specific parcels at, at, off the top of my head, but the, the requirement is a minimum of three acres of commercial zoning a, within a half mile. Sorry. <laughs> so it, it meets that criteria. I just don't know which parcel is exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. Any, um, yes, uh, council member Eagles? You know, this is new to me, so I may be asking very dorky questions, but there was a lot there. And I, uh, the environmental impact report, am I correct in the interpretation that that is only on these rezoned properties at Carquinas and Arnold? Or am I missing the point there? Is that what the environmental impact has looked at? Or is it looked at a broader issue or, or just these new rezoned properties? Can you help me with that, Nina? Thank you, by the way, for the presentation. But I may have missed something that's really important to understand here. Yeah, no, it, it is a lot. Um, so the, the EIR analyzed the potential impact, the, the impacts of potential rezoning for all 59 sites. Oh, OK, all 59. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. not just the two Glen Ellen sites that you, or the, is it a two or one in Glen Ellen? Was it uh, it's two properties? Two parcels, two parcels, one site basically. So it's kind of looked at as one, but it is two legal parcels. Okay, but the EIR of course is much broader than that. Okay, that, that's helpful, thank you. 
Um, I have a question about, um, it's, it's my understanding that, uh, then, then we'll get to Vice Chair Das. Um, it's my understanding that, uh, you know, if, if a parcel gets put under this program, that, that once that happens, there will be no, uh, it'll be ministerially, um, whatever you call that, permitted, and there wouldn't be necessarily an opportunity for public comment or review after that point. So I should have explained uh, what by right means. By right just means that the, the use of the land for housing is already approved. And it doesn't mean that there's no opportunity for public review because we still have a design review requirement. Um, <coughs> but it means that um, to, to contrast that with the discretionary approval, it means that the land use is approved. So there's no, um, there's no question as to whether housing can be developed there. It's just a matter of um, it being reviewed for compliance with all applicable design guidelines. And the design review committee then is the, is the final decision maker. And would just one quick follow-up would, um, if it was approved, then would, would, um, would the person developing the property be required to put a certain number of units on the property? There are minimum densities. So for the workforce housing combining zone, the minimum density is 16 units per acre. Um, it doesn't have to be applied to the entire site. So I, I believe this was actually analyzed uh, as though it were applied to the entire site. So the whole site would have to accommodate a minimum of 16 units per acre. Um, I know that sounds like a lot, but actually the project that um, that um, Stephen Sorkin commented on at the beginning um, in public comment, that I, I wanted to see um, what the density of that project was. And it comes out to over 30 units per acre. And the reason for that is that that site and this site are already um, allowed to develop with mixed uses. So, um, and there's no, there's no specified density for mixed uses. It's more of a um, lot coverage and proportion of the project that is devoted to residential uses. That, that Those are the constraining factors. So they can develop with mixed uses already and at even greater densities than, than the workforce housing combining zone contemplates. All right, thanks. And uh, Vice Chair Das? Uh, yes, could you please give us uh, just a brief description of workforce housing. And again, this, uh, and then I have another question regarding. Oh, I'm, I missed the, the second question, but I can respond to the first one first. <laughs> um, so with workforce housing, so a combining zone is um, a zoning designation that is placed on a property on top of its uh, what we call base zoning. So in this case, the base zoning is limited commercial and workforce housing is applied on top of that to add additional land uses. So it doesn't take any away from the, the property. So everything that's allowed in, under limited commercial is still allowed. It just adds the ability to also develop housing. So it could be housing, could be commercial, could be both. Um, it's, it doesn't require that housing be developed. Um, it so it basically allows more pieces. flexibility for the developer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the number of units, you said 16 minimum, 24 maximum, I think you said. Did I get that correct? Units per acre, yeah. So, so in this means, case, the, the whole site is about 8.85 acres, if I remember correctly. Oh, OK. So it's not a full acre. Mm -mm. I think it's allowed. 20, I think the math works out to 20 units for the whole site under, uh, or sorry, that would you'd need a range. I think it's 20 maximum. Um, I can't do math in my head, so. <laughs> the next question is probably my not understanding uh, the, uh, the language of the, of the zoning, but um, so these must be apartments or something of that nature, because you couldn't have 24 individual units there or 20 units. There. Um, so it is, um, the, the form isn't necessarily specified, but I believe that just based on the, the 
the terminology multifamily in the code, that it's rental housing. Yeah. And I should point out just because this question often comes out, multifamily housing does not allow vacation rentals. So um, regardless of any other rules about vacation rentals, if it's rental housing, it, it can't be converted to vacation rental. I think as you give us more explanation, we're starting to get a picture of what's going to be on this 0.85 acres and, and how you could have uh, 20 units there. It's starting to become clear what, what might be potential. While it still could be commercial, it has now the could have now the potential to be housing. That's right. That's exactly right. Thank you very much. Are there uh, comments from council members? Another question, Mark. Yeah, Councilmember Newhouser. Um, you mentioned that uh, this is affordable, um, but affordable can be anywhere from very low income to low to moderate. Um, are there any requirements that would, um, you know, regarding that which category the uh, requirements must fulfill? So as far as each individual project goes, there's no requirement that they be affordable beyond the county's minimum requirements. So we have an inclusionary um, zoning or um, program that requires uh, the project to contribute to affordable housing in some way, whether that's units or a fee or a, another contribution. Um, so this, I think I was referring to the overall requirement that we plan for. Um, different uh, income levels of housing um, and that then we have to report on an ongoing basis how many affordable units and at what income levels we're permitting. Um, but this project doesn't put any affordability requirements on any of these sites. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it, it, yeah unfortunately it, it seems like that puts a limitation on um, you know, meeting affordable housing requirements and it could be approved ministerially. So it's, it seems a little problematic in that sense. I'm also anticipating some other questions. Um, there's the uh, design guidelines and you had mentioned that in your presentation. Um, I think this is one of the oldest buildings um, in Glen Ellen and is, would there be any requirements to preserve the at least the uh, part of the structure as a component of the any new development. So let's see. Um, I I did want to just follow up on um, on what you said about the affordability uh, issues, and so th I can only say that the county has a number of incentive programs to encourage developers to. Um, include affordable units in their program. And in the case of workforce housing, it's actually only by right if they include affordable housing. So that is something that's a little bit unique to, um, to, the, to the workforce housing combining zone compared to the regular urban residential zones. So um, the ministerial approval for a project that would develop on the site under the workforce housing combining zone, um, it would have to include some affordable units. Um, so, but, and we have other incentives that we, um, that we offer to developers, including fast tracking and um, relaxation of some development standards under state law. Um, but you, you're right that there, there is no um, specific affordability requirement for this site. And now that I've uh, gotten off track, your other question uh, was about the historic uh, historic preservation in that building in particular, um, I assume the, you mean the, the one on the corner the, that's green in the, in the street view view. Um, it, uh, so historic landmarks commission, the county landmarks commission reviews all projects that uh, have historical significance. This project doesn't have historic zoning or I mean this property doesn't, um, but there are mitigation measures in the EIR that require uh, preservation and or, um, well, not and or, but uh, the, the require 
so one of the reasons that actually the cultural resources topic area had significant and unavoidable impacts is because we don't already know um, certain things about the sites and the age of buildings changes as time passes, right? So um, as, as buildings age, they may become eligible for um, historic designation. And so there's just too much unknown um, at the time of the EIR to be able to mitigate them all to less than significant. So yes, historic preservation was absolutely, um, or historic resources, I should say, is absolutely addressed in the EIR and in our um, development uh, design review processes generally. I, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so there's, you know, this, this site has been up for possible development for, for a while. And back in 2016, I came and spoke uh, to the, um, I think it was the Planning Commission and the Landmarks Commission, they have a, a dual meeting. I think that's right. And, and uh, wrote, a, I'm a local historian. And so, and I had also done some historical background research for the that building on the corner. And I uh, found that it's probably the oldest commercial building in downtown Glen Ellen. Uh, it was built during the railroad era early, early on. Um, so all that information is you know, is at the county somewhere, but I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not clear to me that that was actually um, tapped for, you know, you said there's not much information, but there's actually a, a fair bit of information that, that I have and that the county has about that site as a historic resource. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not that there's no information about structures, but the cultural resources also um, deals with artifacts and, and things we can't see. Um, so, and yes, that, that, project that these parcels did have a development proposal on them and we that has been withdrawn um, as of a few months ago I think um, and just to reiterate the, the this project or this rezoning does not have does not contemplate any development so it doesn't contemplate demolition of the building and replacement with new building or any specific kind of development that will come when a project comes in for design review. And at that point, all that information will be, uh, will be requested and will be evaluated as part of the proposal. Thanks. Any other um, comments or questions? Yeah, Council Member Neuhauser. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just had a couple of follow-up questions. Um, um, my understanding is that there were, uh, I think as the part of the EIR, there was um, identification of alternate sites. Um, and I think that as far as reaching or attaining your objectives of identifying as many possible uh, housing sites, um, there would be an interest in finding other alternatives, but apparently there weren't any for this particular area. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to that and interest in trying to find other places, especially since the current, uh, currently identified site uh, has been withdrawn from proposed building project. Are you looking for alternative sites? And can you, would you consider um, sites that are outside of the town core or the, what is, I think, described as the job center? So uh, as far as um, considering a, alternative sites now, um, the, the EIR only studied these 59. So there was no opportunity through this process to look at alternative sites um, that, that weren't those 59. Mm -hmm. um, it's very possible that throughout the housing element planning period, as I mentioned, if we lose sites to development that doesn't meet the density that we had, um, had assumed or planned for, um, we may need to find additional sites um, throughout that eight year period. So it's very possible that we will be identifying more sites again in the future um, the, the, the general, um, the general plan <laughs> generally limits urban development outside of that, um, general plan designated urban service area. 
So that's pretty much the boundary for the county um, for permit Sonoma. Like we wouldn't look at sites beyond that boundary for urban development. Um, so it might not be right on uh, Arnold or right in that jobs core, but it would have to be within the urban service area. One last question, if I may. Um, why now go for a basically a zoning uh, exemption or you know to to exempt projects to meet these guidelines? Why not wait till we're in the full um, general plan update process, which is, as you mentioned, supposed to be happening now anyway. Um, I was just, you know, I think that there may be the perception that we're sidestepping what is a critically important process um, of updating the general plan and the housing unit in that process. If you're referring to the housing element as uh, as a part of the general plan, this project most definitely is a part of the housing element. It's um, it's required as part of the housing element. The housing element is required to be updated by the end of 2022. Um, the larger general plan update is not has not really gotten underway, and it won't be uh, completed before the housing element has to be adopted and certified. So the housing element waits for no no plan. It has to, it has to move forward now. Okay. So, so whatever you're doing now in this whole public process is part of that housing element component of the general plan update. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's, that's good to know. Thank you. All right. Any other comments from uh, council members? All right. We're going to, going to move into public comment and um, to start that off, um, I'm going to um, just read a, a distillation of two emails that were received by the MAC over the last week. Um, and I think I'm under the two minute limit here. So if uh, Ariel wants to start the clock, I have two of them. So I'll read the first one. You can time me on that. Okay, this, this one is from um, Vicki Hill, who is a, sorry, let me get her title right. Um, well, she's a land use planner um, and she has a, an MPA land use planner. Okay, so here was her, um, here's her email uh, that was sent to PRMD and also to the MAC and you can start the clock. This letter contains extensive comments regarding the EIR scope for the Sonoma County proposed rezoning sites for housing project specifically regarding the two properties in Glen Ellen at the corner of Carquinas and Arnold Drive. My comments include concerns about the scoping process, timing and lack of notice, especially during the pandemic. Uh, two, lack of consideration of previous comments submitted regarding this property. Three, inappropriateness of including these parcels given other housing being developed nearby and to be included in the SDC specific plan. Four, inadequate definition of the county's proposed rezone project for the purposes of CEQA and five serious environmental impacts. In my professional opinion, the proposal for these two parcels in Glen Allen involves inappropriate and precedent setting rezoning to a potential high density zone district, which is out of scale and has a potential to result in adverse impacts, excuse me, significant adverse impacts on the small village of Glen Allen. Based on previous comments and comments presented below, I hereby request that the county remove the two Glen Allen parcels from rezoning consideration, given potential environmental effects, other housing being developed, and the large amount of housing that will be included in the SDC plan less than a mile away. So those are comments from uh, Vicki Hill, uh, land use planner, and you can stop the clock on that one. And the next one is from Terry Shore, who's an advocacy director um, with the Greenbelt Alliance. And um, we can start the clock. And this is just um, a few highlights from her letter, which is about seven pages long. This is actually about the whole, the whole process. Um, so she says that um, Greenbelt Alliance finds uh, of the uh, review of the draft EIR finds significant and unavoidable impacts that cannot be mitigated 
in two critical areas of major relevance to public health and safety and climate change, wildfire risk reduction and vehicle miles traveled. Um, and then she says, or the Greenville Alliance says, when it comes to wildfire risk, the EIR acknowledges that the medium density housing being proposed is the type of housing most at risk for loss of life and home to wildfire. Um, then in another section, it says, uh, the EIR clearly states the generation of vehicle miles traveled by this project is in direct conflict with the county's plans to address climate change emissions, reduce, reduce driving and focus on climate smart city centered growth. Um, it also says um, that the analysis is inadequate and the findings are flawed. Um, the rezone project would uh, is acknowledged in the EIR as um, exceeding, this is quote, exceeding established population and housing forecasts. It fails to provide adequate evidence or provide any analysis to explain why it needs to go forward given it exceeds population and housing forecasts. Um, affordability, another failure of this project in EIR is to identify the number of affordable units that would result. And finally, um, the rezone encroaches on voter approved urban growth boundaries in several cities and their associated sphere of influence. I think that was, so that's, that's the gist. Um, and thank you. And that's, that was from Terry Shore from the Greenbelt Alliance. And the first one was from Vicki Hill, um, land use planner. Okay, now we can um, move on to uh, regular public comment. So um, Hannah, are there any, anybody have their hands up? Yes, we have um, three hands raised at this time. So I'll go ahead and get started with our first um, commenter and that is Tracy. You should now be able to unmute. All right, welcome Tracy. Hello, so um, uh, I just have a question. Well, I have concerns, but my main question is, um, I don't understand how 59 separate parcels across all of Sonoma County can fall under the same EIR. It just doesn't make sense to me when there are, I mean, this scope of this thing goes from like Pine Grove to Cloverdale to Glen Ellen. And each of these parcels has to have their own individual constraints and their own individual um, the, um, things that are good about them. And so I, I struggle as a community member and as a larger Sonoma County resident to understand how this is a good thing. I also, believe it or not, have actually delved into Rena and read their methodology, which I don't understand because it's extremely arcane. I know that there are ways that the county can go back to Rena and to ABAG and say, hey, look, this won't work here. Um, and I think the main reasons you might wanna do that would be because of wildfire, and because this is a rural area, and I know there have been a lot of references to it being urban, but you know, compared to Santa Rosa, compared to Sonoma, compared to Petaluma, we're not. We're very, very rural, and and that has to be taken into consideration. So, I would in, encourage the council and encourage the county to um, look at this as a project specific to Glen Ellen, as opposed to part of this grander, larger scheme of things. Um, and that's all, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. All right, and our next commenter is Jay. You should be able to unmute. Welcome, Jay. Hi, good to be here, can you hear me? Yes. I have a question uh, and I just, is it possible after, uh, given that this was adopted and became force of law that a project could be proposed that would require further environmental analysis, impact analysis, than what will be done in this document. Could there be uh, further required focused EIRs on the nature, given the nature of a specific project, which can cover a whole lot of ground there? Or is this supposed to foreclose any future uh, EIR uh, endeavors? Thanks, Jay. And, and um, Hannah, can we are we able to go back to the presenter, to Nina, and, and uh, get an answer to that? 
I think it would be up to you as to whether you want to finish the comments and then do the questions or go back and forth now. Uh, uh, let's, um, okay, let's, yeah, let's keep going with public comment. I'll just make a note here about um, whether additional EIRs uh, would, could be required as the property was developed. All right, and I'll let our um, next commenter, you should now be able to unmute. This is for Alice. Yeah, thank Welcome, you. Hi. So um, I have a question. Um, as noted, you know, there was a prior proposal for redevelopment of these two parcels, and that has been um, withdrawn. But uh, there was a lot of public comment that was submitted that's part of the record about that um, previous proposal. And a lot of the comments were really against the idea of increased density. And at that point, I think it was like 13 units or something. So I, I, my question is, or is any of that prior public comment being taken into consideration or will it be taken into consideration? Or that's just kind of like a clean slate and we have to start all over with that. And then my second question is, it seems like with this whole project and the update of the general plan and the housing element and all of that, it's not really taking into consideration the fact that significant housing is going to be put in at the SDC. And uh, yes, that's not going to be for X number of years and who knows how long that'll be, but I mean, it's mandated by the state. It is coming. And it seems like it's going to be a sizable number of houses. So how is that? Is that actually being factored into this EIR at all? Because that seems like this huge, um, you know, a, a really huge question that's sitting there because that development will have a, an enormous impact on Glen Ellen. And cumulatively, all of this is, is really going to be a big deal for us. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And I, we'll come back to that um, after all the comments. All right. And there is one more hand raised. Our next commenter is Larry. You should now be able to unmute your Larry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Larry. Okay. Hi. Uh, I wanted to know where do I go to find out what kind of analysis was done to look at what the cost of servicing a high density center in the middle of the rural community and village of Glen Ellen would be and what the relative cost of that would be to put the same housing in the middle of uh, our existing urban areas that have the ability to write a whole bunch of services and provide them, whereas the county uh, right now calls us an urban service district, but as we know, the county's not really set up to be an urban service governmental agency. And so it's a stretch to think that we get the same social services or community services or infrastructure services that they do in the downtown of even Sonoma, let alone Santa Rosa or Sebastopol or any of the other cities of the county. And I thought the thrust of the general plan was we were going to have a city-centered density of housing, and then we were going to have the rural areas be kept as places for people to be able to enjoy our uh, other qualities of life up here in Sonoma. So I'd like to see the economic studies that they did to show what the relative cost would be for uh, providing the services that are required for high density housing in the middle of uh, rural villages. I uh, need to know who did those studies and where they are. Thank you, Larry. And we'll come back to that after public comment. Um, anyone else with their hand up? And Chair Dawson, I'm not seeing any additional hands at this time. Okay, we'll, we'll go back to um, Nina Bellucci. And, and um, Nina, I've, I've written down some notes here. Um, uh, so uh, first question from Jay Gamble was, um, you know, if there was a proposal to develop the site could there be, if it all went through, as Jay said, uh, could there still be additional EIRs required to look at the, the impacts? So if 
if a project is substantially different from what was analyzed in the EIR, it may need additional environmental review. Um, but the, the idea is that the EIR analyzed the greatest possible uh, development that the, the site has potential for. Um, so it, it certainly was intended not to require additional environmental review, but if somebody comes in with a proposal for something completely different, you know, a different kind of rezoning uh, or an additional rezoning to all residential or, you know, a much um, higher density project, then it could require uh, another environmental review to be done. But if it, if it met the requirements of the, um, under the, the project we're talking about, it, it wouldn't need another review. Is That's that right. correct? That's okay. Right. Um, and another question was, um, were from Alice Horowitz, uh, were the prior public comments about developing the site considered um, and putting together the, the 59 sites? Um, so the EIR is, is looking at environmental impacts of potential rezoning. So um, we did, you know, we had a scoping period, a comment period. Um, many comments were received on these two sites and, and the merit of rezoning them, but that's not a CEQA issue. That's a, that is an issue for decision makers, for the public. Um, that's kind of a, a now issue. We, we're going, you know, to do that public outreach work and, um, and talk about the merits of rezoning. Um, so uh, short answer, no, those comments were received on a specific project, a specific proposal, a specific design. Uh, and that's not what was, it's not a part of this EIR. Um, this e and in particular, this EIR is looking at physical environmental impacts, I'm sorry, not just physical, but environmental impacts under CEQA. Um, comments on whether it's appropriate, um, whether, you know, there is no design to comment on at this point, so there, we won't be asking about um, the, the merits of the design, but whether the project should, whether this property should be rezoned or not, wasn't a CEQA issue. That's a, an issue for us to explore now. Okay, thank you. And um, let's see, was, was um, SD, the fact that we're gonna be adding a lot of housing or at least at some amount of housing out at the developmental center, in the future, was that factored into uh, choosing a site in Glen Allen? Uh, SDC is noted in the EIR as a, a, a project that should be considered in the cumulative impacts uh, discussion that's required under CEQA. Um, as far as I am aware, we don't have enough information about what's proposed at SDC to say, and I think the question also related to how SDC will play into the arena, meeting arena. I, and I don't know enough, uh, I don't know enough about SDC as a project really to speak on that intelligently. And we didn't know enough about it um, when we started this EIR to, to, um, to get into specifics about that project in the EIR for this project. Um, but CEQA does require that we look at cumulative impacts of all known projects. So it is addressed in that way. And it certainly, um, I am not sure if the timeline matches up with the housing element timeline. So I don't know if that project will be approved by the time the housing element um, has to be adopted. Um, but certainly whenever it is approved and those units or the, the, and whatever land within SDC is zoned for housing, um, whenever we have that information, then we will we, we may be able to count those sites in inventory, um, but we just don't know enough right now. I'm not familiar with, um, you know, what, what the state wants to require on SDC, but I wonder if, does anybody know if there's a minimum housing requirement at the at SDC that possibly those numbers could at least be, you know, considered in the official uh, redevelopment of this area? Tracy, are you if you're still there? Do you do you happen to know? Is that you know? I don't know. I know it's it's all up in the air, but there maybe the state may have said you know minimum of whatever two hundred and fifty units at SDC, and it seems like that could be considered if if we had a number like that, at least it'd be something to start with. Um, uh, pardon the interruption, but Tracy has raised her hand. If you'd like me to. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, Tracy. All right, one moment. 
All right, you should now be able to be. Um, yeah, that's a good question. The state, um, I actually was just looking at the legislation today on another matter, um, and the state does not specify specifically how many units are supposed to be um, developed on SDC. Um, and all kinds of numbers have been thrown around, but nothing has been set in stone. But I think it is something that, um, you know, just as a general overview question, you know, we've got those, these RENA requirements, but there doesn't seem to be any um, comprehensive, uh, and, and Nina may be able to correct me here, there doesn't seem to be any comprehensive idea of how many projects are in the works that could meet those RENA requirements and whether a project like this versus a project at SDC versus something that's being developed in Santa Rosa, you know, how those all add up to meet those requirements. A follow up on that, and then I'll, and I'll get back to Larry's questions. Um, if someone builds an ADU in Glen Ellen, does that, does that count toward Rena? Uh, it does. Once the ADU is permitted, it gets reported, um, but we can't count. Um, there's a, there are a few different ways that the state keeps, keeps an eye on our progress in, in meeting our housing needs. Um, first, we have to have this site inventory that shows, hey, we're planning for all the numbers of new homes that you think we need. And then there's the annual report where we report on building permits issued, projects approved. So permitted ADU does get reported and counts um, towards our RIA, but we can't count sites that allow ADUs mm -hmm. as in our site inventory. Right, but an ADU that was built you know, recently would, would be somewhere in all the figures. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, that's good. Um, so then Larry's questions um, was the, was the um, basically about the comparison of um, um, servicing costs uh, for uh, development like this in a more rural area compared to an urban area and and what where do the who made the calculations and where do they what do they use to do that the EIR does not consider the cost of service um, or of extending service but the EIR does look at or did um, examine the availability of services so the utility section of the EIR has kind of a, a two-tiered approach. Sites that um, uh, have service available um, were analyzed, you know, under you know, the, the assumption that services are available and then sites that would need extension of services got uh, um, analyzed for the extension as well as, as the provision, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I specifically about the cost that EIR does not speak to cost, I can't speak to cost. Um, only the service providers can really um, know what the cost is going to be, and they plan for um, for additional housing units to be built. Um, some of them don't have as much capacity as others. Um, I don't remember exactly what the service um, the service uh, sewer water service situation is for these two sites and in that urban service area. Um, I know the EIR is a monstrous document. Nobody, nobody wants to read it, but it is all in the EIR. Um, and projects always have to um, show that they have service in order to get approved. So even under the, um, even though this EIR will have been done for, for all of these 59 sites, once they come in with a development proposal, they, um, they have to show that they have service. They, you can't build without it. All right, thanks. Um, any other comments from the public? Okay, any, any last comments from uh, council members? Sorry to interrupt once again. There is one additional hand raise. Um, okay. The attendees yeah. would like me to, okay. Um, Who is this? This is for Stephen, and you are now able to unmute. Welcome, Stephen. I have unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I, I just wanted to address the uh, that 
urban service area question since I'm uh, very familiar with it as a developer. And uh, one of the reasons that I chose to build my project in Glen Ellen is that it is one of the highest quality urban service areas for development. It's, proxim it's as proximate to transit as any sites are in Sonoma Valley. It's as proximate to a uh, grocery store, to the post office. It has high speed internet available by two different providers, both AT&T Fiber and through Comcast. It's uh, very easy to provide electric service to from PG&E. It uh, additionally has good water supply, as good as anywhere in Sonoma Valley, and it has good sewer capacity, especially with the trunk improvements that are taking place in Fetters Hot Springs. So it's an, it, it's an ideal site in Sonoma Valley for providing housing because it's also walkable to most of these services, and there are very few walkable development sites left in Sonoma Valley. Sounds like something for us to work on, more walkable, more walkable communities. So thank you, Stephen. That's, that's a good perspective. All right, last chance for comments. All right, well, Nina, thank you so much for joining us and, and um, going into detail about um, how this whole process works. And uh, we appreciate the chance to, to chime in with our thoughts. And, um, and so I also encourage people again to either make public comments tomorrow at the county meeting by Zoom at 1 p.m. Uh, information may already be up in the chat, but it's on the county website. Um, and you can also make uh, comments by email up through June 18th, I believe. So um, uh, two more ways you can, you can comment. Yes, thank right, you. Thanks, everyone. Chair Dawson, council members. Thank you. Have a good rest of the evening. Thank you, Nina. All right, we're going to move on now to um, our, our second um, county presentation. Um, and this one is about the Sonoma Valley um, Sanitation Local Hazard Mitigation Plan, which um, which actually I went on the website today and I, I was able to take a quiz. Um, so I was able to learn a little bit more about this, which I'm sure they're gonna tell us about, but there's some stuff online just so you know. Um, and so I'd like to introduce um, our presenters from Sonoma Water. Um, and excuse me if I mispronounce anyone's name here, but uh, Parastu Hushial Sadat, Barry Dugan, Kent Gilfa, uh, Cynthia De Leon and Carlos Diaz. Good, good evening, Chair Dawson and council members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this evening. Uh, I'm going to turn this over rather quickly to Paris Stu, who's our project manager for overseeing the development of our, or the update to our local hazard mitigation plan. It's a document um, that we use to, uh, to make us eligible for federal FEMA funding uh, to help protect against uh, natural hazards. Um, we, I, I won't give away all uh, Paris to thunder, so I'll turn it over to her. Um, but, um, well, I'll turn it over to you, Paris to, uh, Our other members were introduced already, so thank you very much. All right, thank you, Kent. And right. welcome, Paris to. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Dawson, council members. Um, just need to do something with my screen here. Um, so my name is Pastu Hushial Sadat, and I'm working in the Engineering and Resource Planning Division of Sonoma Water. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today. My colleagues and I are going to talk about what Sonoma Valley County Sanitation District is doing to eliminate damages to sewer facilities as a result of natural hazards and also solicit community input. Next slide, please. The district serves uh, more than 11,000 parcels in Sonoma Valley from Shellville to Glen Ellen and has three primary infrastructure elements sewer collection system, wastewater treatment plant, and reclamation facilities. 
I am going to talk about updating local hazard mitigation plan or LHMP. I'll explain the background of the plan, what has been previously done, what we are currently doing, what is our public outreach strategies, and then answer any questions you might have. Next slide, please. In uh, January 2008, the Board of Directors of the Sonoma County Water Agency, which manages the SVCSD operations, adapted a local hazard mitigation plan, or LHMP, in accordance with the Disaster Mitigation Act. And in 2012, the Water Agency's LHMP was updated. In 2012 Water Agency LHMP, the Sonoma Valley infrastructures were assessed in a very high level. Uh, one of the hazard mitigation actions identified in Water Agency's 2012 LHMP includes development of a, a multi-hazard vulnerability assessment of each sanitation district managed and operated by the Water Agency, including the Sonoma Valley. And sanitation district. In direct response to this mitigation action, the Sonoma Valley County Sanitation District has uh, prepared local hazard mitigation plan for district sanitation facilities in 2016. Uh, DMA requires LHMP to be updated every five years in order for applicant or us basically uh, to be able to apply for any FEMA grant program for the projects that are defined in LHMP. The current LHMP will expire in September. Late last year, FEMA awarded the district a grant to update current LHMP and we are now working on it. Next slide, please. Uh, the purpose of LHMP is to identify risks posted by natural disasters and incorporates strategies to minimize damage from those disasters. LHMP includes different chapters. The beginning chapters describe district assets, including treatment plant, disposal facilities, and collection system, as well as an overview of potential hazards and vulnerability assessment of district's infrastructure to, to those hazards. Then LHMP talks about mitigation goals and objectives and actions, which are the main focus areas of the plan. Um, the final chapters present LHMP implementation strategies and maintenance. And, and as it was mentioned before, LHMP should be updated every five years. And next slide, please. A natural event causes a hazard when it harms people or properties. Natural hazard identified in Sonoma Valley are earthquakes, flooding, fire, and landslides. Tornadoes and hurricanes are low risk in this area. Um, the district focused on uh, seismic and flood hazards in 2016 LHMP. And while seismic is still the most critical hazard in the region, this time we are going to have more emphasis on recent wildfire hazard as well as um, climate changes. Next slide, please. So in the 2016 LHMP, we defined three goals. The goal one was to increase organizational efficiencies and effectiveness when responding to natural disasters. Goal two was to increase reliability of the treatment system capabilities during and after natural disasters. And goal three was to increase reliability of the wastewater collection system and disposal facilities to maintain conveyance capabilities during and after natural disasters. And each goal had several objectives and mitigation actions to reduce the effects of each hazard. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so key factors that were considered in the development of the mitigation actions included significant of impact. For example, a potential break along the trunk main, which serves the whole uh, district would have a more significant impact in terms of number of people affected and risk to public health and safety compared to a, a smaller diameter collection pipe serving a limited area. And the second factor is likelihood of failure. For example, more damages is likely to occur in areas of very high 
liquefaction potential near waterways compared to the areas with moderate liquefaction potential far from creeks. The third factor is the cost to implement a project. Mitigation actions that are relatively low cost to implement will increase the overall benefit cost assessment. The um, 2016 implementation strategy was based on two tiers and each tier had two categories. The tier one actions are those that provide the highest cost benefit and once implemented will result in substantial improvement in the overall reliability of the system. Priority A actions included those actions that were estimated to have potential to be completed or initiated within that five year life of the plan. And then priority B consisted of those actions for which the availability of dedicated resources or opportunities aren't likely happen within that five years. The second tier actions are considered desirable and will further enhance the system reliability once the first tier objectives are achieved. So tier two actions included all remaining mitigation actions with benefit cost assessments below the tier one threshold. Um, next slide, please. So since 2016 LHMP, we implemented several projects to address <clears throat> those hazards. So I'll talk about the four major projects here. The first one was that we established emergency preparedness and response program and developed the 21-24 emergency management strategic plan. We are in final stages of developing a new emergency operation plan. We also implemented Sonoma Water Alert Notification System or SWAN, which can provide immediate information and instruction to a staff associated with emergency response, as well as provide rapid notification to uh, district customers when there are issues impacting the wastewater system. And the other project is replacing of trunk store near Maxwell Park, which is basically part of the trunk main construction. The third one is repairing collection system at Sonoma Creek and Polar Creek banks. And the most recent one is seismic retrofit of the uh, two clarifiers in the treatment plant, which we got fund from, from FEMA. Next slide, please. So uh, we had a federally compliant RFP and received three proposals in December of last year. We selected InfraTerra based on their technical expertise and experience with the local hazard mitigation plans. The intent of hiring a consultant is to have more technical support for mitigation actions. As I mentioned earlier, the district experienced two major fires since 2016. The 2021 LHMP update will focus also on the vulnerability analysis of fire hazards and public safety power shutoffs when the fire weather conditions exist. Um, hazards related to climate change, such as sea level rise, additional infiltration and inflow into sewer system, and subsequent additional flows to treatment plant and reclamation facilities will be assessed too. Our plan is to have the, the document available for public review end of July so that we can submit it to FEMA um, in a timely manner. The, uh, the 2016 LHMP didn't have a public survey. We decided to add one to this 2021 LHMP update to make sure that we have more public engagement. Next slide, please. I think I'm going to have um, to ask Barry to talk about opportunities for community involvement on this slide. Thank you, Paris, too. And thank you, Chair Dawson and members of the council for uh, uh, allowing us to present tonight. The, um, we've had a number of opportunities and we'll continue to have opportunities for public input. Uh, we have used our uh, Sonoma Water e-newsletter, which goes to several thousand um, uh, 
uh, recipients to uh, broadcast the news that this LHMP is being developed and it's in a draft form. Uh, Paris do mentioned the survey information. We used that survey. Uh, we got a, a fair response. I won't say it was a great response, but it's the first time that we've done it for an LHMP and we'll use that to inform uh, the, the draft as well. We have used our social media outlets, which are very active. Uh, the Prop 218 newsletter, which uh, any, any customers of the Sonoma Valley County Sanitation District uh, receive, uh, had a story in it about the, about the project. Um, and we have reached out directly to stakeholders, including yourselves, uh, also the Sonoma Valley uh, Municipal Advisory Council uh, we've presented to. And we have information on our website. Um, anyone with comments can, can send an email to lhmp at scwa.ca.gov. Uh, and also <clears throat> we will be publicizing the public comment period once the draft is completed. And uh, we'll do that through our website, um, through press releases, social media, and also um, advertise in the local newspaper as we did for this project when it was updated five years ago. So I'm uh, happy to answer any questions about public outreach when, when that time comes. Thanks, this slide, please. So um, that's what we prepared for today. Any uh, additional questions, comments, in addition to the ones that we are answering today, can be directed to me or through Sonoma Water website. Thank you for your time. We are ready to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Paris Stu and Barry. Um, any comments or questions from uh, council members? I have one, uh, just a quick one. Is that survey still, is that still active? Uh, as mentioned, a survey as part of the process. Um, no, it is, it, the survey is no longer active, uh, Chair Dawson. Um, just, I, I noticed on your website, I tried to go into the English version and I, it wouldn't open, but I went into the Spanish version and I, I plugged it all into uh, Google uh, Translate. And so, I, I mean, it, it's no big deal that my answers didn't go in, but it gave me a sense of what this was all about, uh, but oh, okay. the Spanish one's still up, just so you know. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll pass that along. Thanks. Yeah, Council Member Eagles? Yes, since you're, we're talking about public outreach, I did not look at the survey, but, but with this kind of um, hazards mitigation, what kind of, and since we had public on the phone, what kind of input would you be looking for? Do you get from the public on the, the, this sort of issue? Can you give me a kind of a general categorization of it? What are you looking for? Um, well, I think what we're looking for is, is for the members of the public to, to look at the document and, and understand it and understand the, the purpose, what the purpose of it is. So that if, if you know you live in, a, in an area that's more prone to seismic activity, we would want to know that. Or if you uh, live in an area that's more um, prone to flooding or fire, um, and those are the kinds of things that, that we're interested in. And, and what are what are members of the public interested in us taking a look at and, and including in the plan? Okay, so that wouldn't necessarily be be addressed in your research, or it would be, but the public would add an, an extra layer of that sort of information potentially. Well, when we receive input from the public, yeah, we would have the consultant, if if it's appropriate, do additional analysis or research. Got it. Got it. Thank you. So, Barry, I, I would I would add to that that uh, yes, we'd welcome any and all input from the public on that, but, but the document is focused on the Snow Valley County Sanitation District's infrastructure and our ability to provide continued service. So particularly um, feedback from the public as to interest they have in or concerns they might have with our ability to provide reliable sanitation services to, to them. I mean, I'm just trying to point the focus that it is about the sanitation and sewer collection system and our treatment system. Um, that's what the document's focused on, of course. Right, thank but you. One of the questions was uh, just to give Kate a little bit of an idea that goes with this uh, was, was how long would you, uh, what would your expectation be for how long service might be interrupted? You know, a day, a week, a month. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of things you don't control, but, but it, 
it was an idea of the public's expectation of those things. Mm, yeah, I, I yeah absolutely. Um, I, I wish I had a, a very definitive answer for you on that. I mean, there's an array of me ways that our, our system could be harmed, uh, particularly a major earthquake could be could be rather devastating. We're, and we're trying to identify what are some of our greatest risks and greatest consequences could be. There are some worst case scenarios where you could do, I mean, we have one treatment plant. Everything we collect throughout the whole system runs through our treatment plant. If the treatment plant were to encounter significant damage to major process units, um, you, we could be, you know, treating wastewater unsatisfactorily to meet, uh, you know, our permit conditions for a period of months, perhaps. So um, water would continue to, in that case, water would continue to flow to us in most cases. But, you know, if we have several breaks in the trunk main, I would expect that, you know, depending on how, how many breaks we had and how many lines, that could also take days, possibly weeks, to get everything, get everything resolved. So um, I guess the beauty of sanitation is that things flow downhill. So um, we would, we would work, we would act quickly to try to get temporary measures in place so that people continue, could continue to uh, flush their toilets and, and drain water our direction. Um, but our, our systems could be harmed um, for some extended period of time in some of the worst cases, particularly earthquake. Um, fire, you know, we'll, we've had some couple major fires in the, in the valley, as it was mentioned, and as everyone knows, um, we've fared, our infrastructure has fared fairly well uh, in both those fires. Um, so we're a little less concerned about fire, but as Paris Stu mentioned, we'll be giving a closer look to that with this update. Uh, and then flooding poses some risk to our system and big, st big storms as well. Um, so, sorry, it's not a very definitive answer and it's kind of long, but um, it really depends on the nature of the disaster that, that strikes, strikes us. I think we've all learned to live with uncertainty a little more in the last few years. So, uh, yeah. but we appreciate that you guys are there. Um, other, other comments or questions? Yeah, Council Member Neuhauser. Uh, it is at least anecdotal evidence in, in some ex past experience that the um, trunk line, I guess you're referring to as the main uh, sanitation line that runs down through the valley, uh, has uh, significant issues with water, especially during the winter, leaking into the pipe and overwhelming the treatment facility which then triggers unpleasant early releases or an overwhelming of the facility. And I'm wondering if there are plans to either reline or replace the trunk line. And, um, and my second question has to do with um, Barry's uh, scenery. <laughs> uh, maybe you could speak to drought as a disaster and uh, which is could very well be a common situation if we enter a mega drought. Uh, Carlos, you want to try tackle the trunk main replacement work um, before Barry jumps in on his drought? Sure. So um, the water agency has been actively replacing uh, segments, you know, in a, in an orderly kind of fashion, um, in a phased approach, I should say, um, for what is it, Kent, close to a decade now? Yeah, um, 15 plus years. Yeah, so we're currently, you know, in, in um, phase 4C of that effort, and there, there remains, you know, yet another phase 5A and 5B to that trunk main replacement project, but we have been actively replacing um, that trunk main to address that that very issue uh, you raised, Mark, which is um, inflow and infiltration um, into that trunk main, which which you know increases flows uh, down at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, to my knowledge, we fared fairly well down at treatment plant. You know, 2017 was an incredibly wet year. You, you all may remember January and February of that year. It felt 
sometimes like it was never going to stop raining and we probably wish we had a little bit of that now yeah. um uh and february 2019 was also um an incredibly wet period and triggered one of the the largest instantaneous flows we've experienced down there at the wastewater treatment plant um but to my knowledge we haven't had any you know illicit discharges or um discharge violations down there at the treatment plant uh due to you know process limitations we have had uh, sanitary sewer overflows um, in portions of the collection system um, during those periods when too much groundwater and inflow and infiltration is getting into the lines and we're capacity limited. Um, but these trunk main projects are intended to uh, reduce the overall occurrence of those uh, sanitary sewer overflows within, within the system. Um, and as far as drought, Barry, you want to tackle that one? Hopefully we have enough water to keep flushing the toilets and, and keeping the bugs happy down there at the treatment plant. Let's hope so. I just also wanted to add um, to your question, uh, Mark, that one of the other programs that we have is a, um, a, a sewer lateral replacement program, a sewer lateral inspection program. It's also uh, aimed at reducing inflow by uh, assessing the condition of the pri private sewer laterals. So that program's ongoing. So it's a combination of replacing the trunk main and also finding uh, faulty laterals and helping homeowners to replace them. Um, as far as the drought goes, I, I, I don't know that I can uh, tell anybody anything they don't already know. Uh, behind me is Lake Mendocino, which is one of the two reservoirs in the Sonoma water system. And, you know, currently our reservoirs are at all time lows for, uh, for storage for this time of the year. Um, we don't anticipate that changing. Things are probably just gonna keep getting worse uh, until we get rain. And um, as Carlos mentioned, I, my understanding and, and Kent and Carlos can add to it is probably the main impact from a prolonged drought would be the lack of inflow into a treatment plant and the inability to, to maintain the health of that plant. Um, but but I'm just a public information officer. I'm not a scientist. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, let Kent or Carlos uh, elaborate on that. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about water supply. Um, currently, and I'll just say this, that, that currently region wide, we're asking for 20% voluntary conservation. So that means we're asking everyone to reduce their water by 20%. We have a petition to the state that was just filed last week, which will ask for a mandatory 20% reduction in the amount of water that we pump from the river. So that means that in July 1, there'll be a man, likely to be a mandatory 20% cut in water uh, deliveries. Um, so can- I don't maybe, know, Barry. Barry, I think we have room for you in the engineering department, so. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll, I, I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, yes, drought could ultimately affect how the treatment processes work um, with, with less flow, but that's, I, I mean, right now that doesn't strike us as a big urgent concern for us. We have options in how we manage the treatment process, um, but, but there is that potential. I, I wanted to highlight what Barry introduced too, is that yes, the trunk main project that we're doing is gonna help add capacity to deal with some existing inflow and infiltration we have into the system, but the sources of inflow and infiltration are not limited to the trunk main or even the private laterals. I mean, it's our whole collection system, sewers on, you know, so many streets throughout our service area, in, including the private laterals that serve each individual home. So the source of that water is throughout the system. The trunk main is gonna help add some capacity, but there's other projects we need to do to try to help uh, reduce both the private, on the private lateral side and, and in our own system as well, beyond just the trunk main. Mark, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Kent, appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Kent. Any other comments or questions from council members before we go to public comment? Okay, um, Hannah, do we have any uh, anyone with their hand up that would like to ask a question or a comment on the yes, presentation? We do. <laughs> we do have one hand raised at this time. And um, so for our first commenter, Larry, you should be now able to unmute yourself. All right, welcome, Larry. 
Hi, hi. Uh, I am curious, do you have a responsibility or a possibility of getting involved in the relationship with agricultural chemicals in our water systems and how there's a certain kind of interface with the creeks and the drain off from people who have defective sewers and so forth that are not a part of the lateral, but are a part of the general question of what happens with chemicals, what happens with sewer that's loose, and how that affects everything that has to do with the creek, and, a, and I presume the aquifer in some indirect way. And I'm just wondering if you're monitoring the quality of waters in the uh, environmental systems and how our you know, chemicals in agriculture and so forth are affecting those things. It seems to me that, that that's a potential hazard. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I was just going to ask. Question. Carlos, <laughs> Carlos, I'm going to let you fire away with that one. <laughs> you know, I, I was going to speak to um, the existence of the Sonoma Creek pathogens, uh, TMDL. TMDL stands for total maximum daily load. Um, so those are efforts that are being advanced um, by the uh, state uh, water board, uh, specifically the regional water quality control board, uh, for San Francisco Bay, that's region two. Um, and I understand it's been a little while since I've looked at those documents, but I do understand that they have identified, um, in their implementation actions, uh, measures to address, um, failing septic, um, within, within the valley, um, to the degree you're referring to, you know, agricultural runoff, um, I, I believe the nutrient TMDL may have been something to address at least nutrient runoff, but to my knowledge that has been suspended or, or recognized as not being needed and Sonoma Creek um, being, uh, not being identified as an impaired water body with respect to nutrients. Uh, chemicals, I, I'm not so sure of. Um, but that would also fall under the purview of, of the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Kent, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. No, I, no, I, I think that I was going to defer to the state as well. So uh, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments from the public? And um, Chair Dawson, I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Sonoma Water staff, for coming and filling us in on the plans. And, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll wish for the best for all of us uh, that hopefully none of this ever has to get actually implemented in, in the, you know, in an emergency situation. And we appreciate your taking, uh, you know, looking ahead and thinking about resilience for the future. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for your Thanks time. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. All right, um, so we're almost to two hours. Um, we have uh, budget request forms, uh, reports and announcement from council members, which uh, hopefully will be pretty short, and then consideration of items for future agenda. Um, I'm willing to keep going, but if anybody would like to make a motion to adjourn, we could, we could uh, vote on that. I mean, not, not adjourn, I mean, make a motion for a uh, take a break. Okay, looks like we're good. Okay, so um, I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Ariel, uh, who has a slide presentation on uh, the budget request forms. Um, she felt like she wanted to just uh, give a little bit of an update um, on the message that was given a few months ago. And then, we're, then we'll talk about uh, the specific budget requests that have come in uh, and we'll vote on those. And I do wanna offer in the interest of time because I have kind of a, you know, I have kind of like a refresher on the prior presentation and some kind of suggestions for moving forward. Uh, we, can also, we can also split it and just deal with the budget requests for now and um, continue the other part of the presentation um, if you would like, Chair. Um, yeah, if, if you, Ariel, if you feel like we're okay just going ahead and uh, discussing the budget uh, proposals and voting on those, and then um, we could move your presentation to next month. Um, that, that seems fine. Anybody object to that? Okay, um, so 
Okay, it'll take me just a second to get to the right slide then. I yeah. don't want to okay. watch you guys, <laughs> make you guys watch that. So I will just yeah. click over here. Um, so we've got, I'll just kind of give a very quick overview. We have uh, two budget requests, uh, one from the outreach committee to cover um, just some support for uh, some COVID clinics in um, collaboration with the Sonoma Valley um, Community Health Center. And then the other one is from the Emergency Preparedness Committee. Um, and so here they are. So this is, so I'm gonna, you know, cut to the chase, cut to the today matter of my presentation, um, which I just wanted to give you guys kind of a preview of, and I had this all set to go, you know, one, two, three, four, but um, essentially looking at our data for, we've only been here since September, but um, our average minute taker expense is $250 per meeting. Um, Cause you're all aware that you have $10,000. Like we, we, we know that part. So because um, they're paid at $100 per hour. So the average in a normal year, the minute taker expense would be $3,000. Um, this year was a little different because we started in September um, and our minute taker was absent uh, twice. So the actual amount that was spent was um, 1425 um, Taking the average and we have two more months in the fiscal year. So I think that the the minute taker expense will be um, just under 2000. Um, this missing the other part of the presentation is a little more confusing, but essentially we have already put through an allocation for the MAC for ongoing expenses um, for $5,000. Um, that doesn't mean that that's all that you have, but to, to put it through the board for additional things, it, it won't happen until next fiscal year. It will count out of this fiscal year's budget but um, I think maybe some of the preparedness items might be able to wait um, because we can't actually get another item through right now. Um, so that's just so you know, you have a, a good idea of, of what you have. So here's kind of your summary. Um, so we have preparedness ad hoc um, and we have the outreach ad hoc. Um, and sort of a brief description of what they are. And I'm hoping that, you know, um, probably uh, Council Member Newhauser from the Repairness Ad Hoc and perhaps uh, Chair Dawson from Outreach can describe a little more about what these are. Um, so you have a total of uh, 4,800 um, for consideration, um, which is less than the amount available. So, um, you know, you're not running, you, you're not having to make any tough, tough choices here. Right, no, no issues then. Um, okay, well, let me, I'll just give a, a brief, um, I think everyone's received an email with this information, but I'll just give you a brief, um, actually, let me just read. Um, so Council Member Handron, who's with me on the Outreach Committee, she, she was really instrumental in setting up the uh, collaboration with the Health Center. Um, so she sent me this email, so I'll just read you this. This is a, a good overview. Uh, so we'd like to, to help out with a pop-up vaccine clinic. Um, and so Vicki says, I'm working with the Sonoma Valley Community Health Center to get pop-up vaccine clinics in Glen Ellen. Uh, Abbott's Passage, which is the winery, I think of it as Valley of the Moon, but things do change their names. Uh, so the big one right there on Madrone Road, uh, not far from the apartments. Um, Abbott's Passage has agreed to host this clinic in their parking lot and waiting to hear back about the parking lot at Jack London Village. The next step is to select a, di a day and a time focusing on weekends or evenings. It makes sense to me that Abbott's Passage may work on a weekend and Jack London Village might be best if coordinated uh, with the Redwood Empire Food Bank drop off on a Friday morning, which I, I like that idea. Um, so then she says, Arthur made a budget request, which you just saw for flyers and providing snacks. And she says, uh, I'll work with Mary Carmen at the Sonoma Valley Community Health Center to make a flyer and pass them out at the apartments and neighborhoods off and drone. If anyone wants to help, have them reach out to me and she's got her, her uh, email and uh, phone number. Um, so that's, that's basically, we. Um, actually, I'm personally, I'm not totally clear if we would be having uh, four clinics or only two because um, anytime we have vaccine shots, we should have two, two shots. And so I, I'm assuming, you know, we want to have the two shots in the same locations. Uh, so she might be talking about doing four, which I'm, I'm behind that. Um, 
it would just mean spreading our uh, snack money over four events instead of two events. But I, I think it would work either way. Um, so anybody have any questions on that on that budget request? Can we put the slide? Yeah. Oh, excuse me, I just jumped in, didn't I? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, Councilmember Eagles. Yeah. Can we put the slide up again, Ariel, if you wouldn't mind? I'm not sure which budget request this actually was in the end. I thought they were both sort of um, outreach. So let's see. Um, oh, there it is. I'm sorry. It was the second one there for just just 300. Okay, thank you. I think is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That correct. Okay. Oh wow. Yes, that's not very much. Yeah, we. I mean, just you know, um, I mean, there were some limitations on what we were able to. Uh, do and some of it, some of the the funding for the actual vaccine is coming from, um, I think the state, which or maybe ultimately the federal government. So there's, uh, you know, there's not a huge amount, but we can support with volunteering and and um, it'd be a little bit of an incentive if you get to go and get some food. We haven't really talked about what that would be yet, but um, so uh, yeah, it's a small amount, but but it felt like a good connection to make between the MAC and a, and the health center. Yeah, Council Member Morgan. Um, yeah, I think it's a great thing. And Arthur, it might only be two clinics because I found out now that they're actually giving one dose shots. So they might there might be something ah. like that. Okay. Where, where they're doing a one dose. Yeah. Only, one dose only. That would be great. Yeah, that, that seems ideal. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Um, okay. Let's, yeah, Council Member Eagles. Only that, are we going to have any discussion? I mean, it doesn't look like we have a lot of discussion because the amounts are within our budget. But did, did Mark or anyone want to comment on the other amounts? And oh yeah, I was about to give them. Oh, you were going to do that. I'm sorry, I didn't. Well, I missed um, that part. Yeah. Then we'll take public comment after that, and then we'll uh, most likely vote on these two. Yeah, Councilmember Newhouser. Uh, thank you. Um, I. I I think I need to provide some context uh, for my request and it requires a little bit more time, if that's okay, just to explain yeah. uh, what our, how things have evolved since our last meeting. Um, as you may recall, we presented uh, our plan and more part of the plan was putting together a grant proposal and in the process of putting together a proposal for um, uh, emergency preparation, um, we discovered the importance of doing more thorough planning on a much larger level, uh, including the greater Kenwood and Glen Ellen areas. And uh, what we found was that if we do this, what is called a a CWPP, which is a community wildfire prevention plan, that that puts the community in a very good position to be able to get resources and funding for implementation, not only of uh, uh, fire, you know, fuels reduction, but also the outreach and education. So in the process of working on this grant that was submitted today, actually, to CAL FIRE, um, Mark, can I just a quick question on that? Who, who are your partners on the grant? Okay, so we're working with um, FireSafe Sonoma, uh, who is the lead agency, who is uh, not only the providing the expertise and the templates for developing the CWPPs, um, but they're also experts in facilitating the community process. Um, Sonoma Ecology Center, who is also an advocate of a resilient landscaping, would helped immensely with uh, grant preparation um, and would be managing. Uh, we're also partnering with the uh, Kenwood Fire Protection District, um, with the Sonoma Valley uh, Fire District, uh, Glen Ellen Forum, uh, Bouverie Preserve, and um, other people, other organizations and representatives have signed on in support of this. So we pulled together a lot of people relatively quickly in order to move, advance this uh, initiative. So with that in mind, <laughs> it changed from being just a little pilot project, which is what <laughs> Ariel was anticipating, um, to being really a more of a community-wide um, outreach and education project. So um, um, in, in 
in the spirit of supporting what we hope to have funded by this fall, if we're fortunate, we know this is a very competitive process and we may or may not get funding in this round, but we do feel like we have a very compelling proposal based on what was a successful proposal submitted by Camp Meeker, which we were able to borrow from heavily um, um, and that had been previously submitted by Fire Safe Sonoma. They do this for everybody in the county. And um, so we, we do feel like we have a good shot, but um, we'll see, we shall see. But in the spirit of moving forward, regardless of if we get funding, we have this opportunity to do the outreach here in our own communities. So I'm gonna now switch to the actual proposal if my computer comes back up. Uh, I'll just read as you did, Arthur, what we are proposing. Um, the requested funding is for print media outreach and educational materials for the North Sonoma Valley MAC area, including the greater Glen Ellen and Kenwood communities. This is approximately, I'm kind of basing this on what the uh, Kenwood papers outreach in, in or delivery service reaches, which is about 3,600 individual homes. Um, so um, the proposed outreach materials include two Kenwood newspaper inserts. The first insert will be for the introduction of the proposed community wildfire prevention planning process and to generate interest in the Map Your Neighborhood Community Organizing Program. The second insert will be a survey to gauge the willingness of community members to participate in the planning process and in the community organizing and identify uh, community members who will help lead the outreach education implementation of emergency preparedness plans. So there's hopefully we, if we get the planning done, then we will have a plan, which will include not only the outreach education, but fuel reduction and other community awareness um, around evacuation, et cetera. The educational materials consist of workbooks, uh, discussion guides, contact sheets, and other forms and handouts. The workbooks are for all community members to complete and use as a reference. The discussion guides and other forms are for leaders of groups to use during group meetings. The materials will be distributed to all interested groups and neighborhood leaders. So, um, and uh, there's more detail about the numbers and, and all that, but, um, but basically that is what the materials are for. And, um, and the cost of doing the outreach. And we, we found that the inserts um, are very effective um, and, and, and simple because you get um, a targeted audience. They can even target it by routes if you want to, as far as the Kenwood Press. Um, it's an eight and a half by 11 insert. And you may have seen that often it's used for advertising um, but in this case, we could do an insert that would be um, a flyer that would um, allow people to, you know, to provide the information about the upcoming process and opportunity to participate. And then later we could do a survey and that would point to, which I'm hoping that we can set up, which is a, a means by which to, that people can go online to fill it out or fill it out and mail it back to us. Um, so some details to, as yet to work out, uh, but we wanted to um, secure the appropriation for when we're ready to implement. And uh, with that, I'll leave it up to you if you have any questions. Um, Thank you, Mark. Yeah, any questions from council members? I just wanna say, um, it's an impressive amount of work in organizing you guys have done, you and, you and Damon and, and Matt also, right? Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, just thanks for all your efforts. Yeah, it's impressive. It's a uh, clarification. A, a, a big, if I could. <laughs> yeah, yeah Jim, Vice Chair does. <laughs> uh, most of the work was done by Mark Newhouser. Uh, Matt and I were glad to support and add our uh, comments and review, but Mark has done just an amazing job of pulling all this together. And um, I just also want to comment on the tremendous amount of fire safe Sonoma work that's being done throughout the county, especially in Oakmont 
and I'll be sharing some of that with the council later on as we move along, but there's a, a tremendous amount of efforts going on through the multiple communities of North Sonoma Valley. Great. Thank if, you, Damon. If I may add to that, um, Damon, yeah. it's, it's, it's like grabbing a tiger by the tail once you get involved in this. I mean, it, it, there's so much going on and there's so much interest and this is really the time to strike because CAL FIRE has a, a, they have not set an upper limit on the amount of funds available. Um, this, this, the county has even put out a, a proposal to fund projects and is fast tracking funding right now. So there is a lot of interest right now. And, and, and you know, I'm a huge advocate of planning and then acting and implementing. And if we can get some really solid plans under our feet, we'll be able to not only be more effective in our outreach and, and implementation, but be able to secure the resources to do that. And, and one other little tidbit that I was completely unaware of was that, that there is a lot of planning going on, but it's all around the periphery. It's in obviously the hardest hit regions like in the Myakamas and Bennett Ridge. Um, but you know, these are areas that are more vulnerable. They organized early. They've already created what they call either a fire safe council or a fire wise community. And I kind of, I didn't mention this, but the urban areas tend to get called a fire wise community and, and the, the plans are a, a more general. Whereas a fire safe council, it generally tends to be smaller and more rural and, um, and has very specific plans for doing fuel reduction and har house hardening and that kind of thing. So anyway, so we're part of what we're doing is not just the CWP P process, which is this planning process with public engagement, but it's also the forming of two separate firewise communities, one for Kenwood and one for Glen Ellen. And I was really pleased to find that, that the fire districts were just so willing to participate and su really supported the idea and are willing to really step up and provide staff and personnel to help lead the process. So it's, we're not doing this alone and, and we're not certainly the lead. I mean, we're handing it off. I mean, we're just, we're, we're developing it and giving it to the community. So to use a bad metaphor, you were the spark, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The but, hand on the tail of the tiger. Yeah. But nice work, you guys. I mean, yeah, it's obviously. Together. But anyway, going. But, yeah. but we do have a budget. Yeah. So, you know, if you have any other questions regarding the, the costs or the materials, uh, let me know. And so we can make a decision and move on. So if there's no more comments from uh, council members, I'll turn it over for public comment. And I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion to, do we need to, Ariel, do we need to fund these or vote separately or can we just vote to fund them both at the same if, time? If no one's making any amendments or changes, I think you can just approve them both um, for the total total maximum, right? Because, um, you know, if, if your snacks cost $289, you don't get to keep the change, right? So right. there's kind of a, a amount not to exceed yeah. uh, amount. So if you just want to approve both budget requests not to exceed a total of, you know, however okay. you want to craft the motion, that's fine. Right. So do I hear a motion uh, to fund both of these proposals uh, in an amount not to exceed $4,800? I move. Second. And seconded. And all in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. And anyone uh, not in favor? All right, unanimously passed. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. And one thing about this whole, uh, you know, allocating of funds, I think we, we learned, we'll, we'll start earlier next time. Um, yeah, that's, that's part of my, the rest of my presentation is kind of, but it would have taken a long time and it would have brought up a lot of people's questions. And I know that no one, no one wants to be here till 8.30. So um, yeah. we can squeeze it into another meeting. It's not time sensitive since we're done allocating yeah. for this fiscal year. 
Well, that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we found a way to, to you know, use some of that money in, a, in really good ways. Before okay, close, um, Arthur, um, I do have one request though. And, yeah. and that, I know it's kind of after the fact since we've already submitted the proposal, but I was hoping to get approval of, you know, um, I don't know if it would be a motion. Ariel, help me out here. I submitted a um, project description um, and request for the approval. Uh, the second, the revised one that you sent me, is that? Yeah, it was basically a letter of support, but it's basically to get kind of a, a you know, an oh. approval of the council in support of the work. Because see, you know, we were getting support letters from all of these different organizations, but we couldn't provide one from the North Sonoma Valley MAC oh, because yeah. we hadn't had a vote. And, um, but I think going forward, I think it's really important to have that on the record that, that the MAC actually supports what we're doing. Um, Kind of a yeah, minor no, that's detail that, there. That, <laughs> no, that makes total sense. So, so do I have a motion? So, would you be willing to draft? No, that it's letter drafted. Form? I think was it distributed, Ariel? No. So I guess I misunderstood. I thought you had sent that saying you were going to put that in the application, like the paragraph that you sent me, and I said no, that. No, it was a separate document. Um, the letter that that Supervisor Gordon signed. Well, I, I mean, yeah, it was similar to that. Um, my my apologies. Oh well. I don't remember seeing a letter for the Mac um, because oh, we shoot. didn't we didn't agendize that, so not to be the brown axe stickler. But um, but I did request it when we put in. I did send a request specifically for that um, a month ago. Um, so it didn't get put on the agenda, huh? Well, let's just make sure it gets put on the agenda for next month and then we can have a... Is, know, this, is, this, is it time sensitive, like you need it for the grant? No, 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 I, I just, it's just okay. going forward. Um, okay, well, I should have double checked that. that that's on me. Um, I thought that request went through um, to have it be put on the agenda. Um, and I guess that just didn't happen, so... Um, yeah, it's kind of a moot point at, at this time. So uh, I'll, I'll make sure that I get that on for the next next meeting. Well, and, and that's part of my presentation that I just did give as well is talking about um, just preview it, I guess, since it is on the agenda. But I, I want to work with maybe the outreach committee to draft kind of a policy for for letters of support for things like that and like using of the logo so that it doesn't so that we can treat them sort of more like a, as a batch, as like a matter of course. If we have a policy, then we can just kind of work it out easier. And so that's something I think would be helpful moving forward for situations like that, as well as possibly other things, so. I think um, that's great because that you, yeah. usually these things are time sensitive and if we have to wait a month then you can really, you can miss a window. So if, yeah, if we had an agreement in advance uh, that would be really helpful and not just for our project for for anybody's project um so okay thank you that sounds good all right we'll put it on the agenda for next month yeah that sounds good um so now we we have um this is the the reports and announcement from council members and ad hocs um i'm going to suggest that uh yeah council member uh, cooper I'm sorry. I, I, I'm trying to get ready for a moving in inspection. My, my contractor came at 7.30, so I need to jump off. He's, he's been patient, but is it okay if I drop off right now? Uh, I, yeah, we'll still have Do a I quorum. Need... Yeah, I think we're, we're all right. Yeah, we still have a, okay. a quorum. Sorry, thank you. It... That's okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, thanks for being here. I'll see you next month. Yeah, yeah. okay. Bye, Jed. Bye, Jed. See you, Jed. So, um, so reports and announcements uh, from council members and ad hocs. Um, I'm gonna say for, for outreach, you've already heard pretty much what we've been up to. We'll, we'll fill you in more next month. Um, uh, anything you wanna add an emergency preparedness? Uh, council member Newhauser? I'm, I'm good, thank you. Okay, and we haven't heard anything from transportation. Council member Eagles, do you wanna, are there any up updates or you wanna just wait till next month? No, I think we'll wait till next month, unless Angela, do you want to add anything? 
I think we're good. We, we actually did just really quickly, um, I, I sent a note to Ariel and Susan about uh, drought and water signs. I had been uh, traveling oh, right. yeah. to Bolinas and uh, saw these great signs and thought, wow, we should have those in our community. And uh, they really love the idea. I thought we could fund it, but I didn't get the funding uh, proposal in in time. But they liked it so much, they sent it to Sonoma Water and the Sonoma County Water Agency, and they're actually going to make the signs and fund it. So wow, we're really great. happy about that. That's a great yep. idea. Helps have a connection. We're, we're pretty, sir. We're 99. <laughs> like, we, we have, they, they are like, we will help you, but I, I don't have the design yet. But um, I, well, yeah. I, I took a picture of the sign in Bellinas and sent it. So they, they have a little bit of a prototype. Yeah. Does it does it say something specifically or? Um, it's <laughs> let me see if I can find it really quick here. Um, <laughs> it says water supply shortage reduce usage now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's what their sign says, but we you know ours can be different. <laughs> Love yeah, our day. Yeah. Some uh, love our town. <laughs> right. I'll have to think about it. Yeah. Save water for us and the planet both, right? Yeah. Well, thanks, Angela. That's that's good. And it's nice to see um, you know, there's several ways, several avenues from to make things happen um, through the Mac. So besides just direct funding. Um okay, so let's move on. Um well, I do uh, so since since uh Councilmember Dickey's not here. I do want to just very briefly, um, SVCAC is next Wednesday and it's a pretty big one. So it's going to be um, the vacation rental ordinance update. Um, the county permit Sonoma is bringing that before SVCAC. And there is also uh, the, the winery event ad hoc. Um, so back in the fall or winter, um, the stakeholder group that has been existing for many years trying to draft a winery event guidelines for specifically the Sonoma Valley area, um, presented their work. The SVCAC was not happy with it. So they formed an ad hoc and actually uh, Council Member Dickey, as well as Margaret Spaulding are on it. So it's both of our North Valley um, people on, on SVCAC. Um, they've got together, I've been in their meetings, they've worked with uh, Ex Officio Carr to craft some really detailed guidelines that are a little more strict. Um, the guidelines documents are, are out. Um, I can send them to you uh, folks if you're interested, just reach out to me. Um, and I don't have the vacation rental documents yet. They're still with County Council, but that's coming up next Wednesday at 6.30. Um, so if you're interested, or, and maybe we can put it on the Facebook page um, to reach the community, but um, just, just FYI. All right. Thanks, Ariel. Um, is there, are there any public comments on um, anything that was brought up in the last uh, announcements? I'm giving it a moment, but I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so now we just move on to the last item, which is consideration of items uh, for the future agenda. So we'll put in the, the uh, generic letter of support, whatever you want to call that. Yeah, I think we can roll that into my, my continued presentation because I did talk about that in yeah. the presentation. Okay, so all right. It's already on deck. Okay. Um, and Mark, if you have more detail, you just let me know, and I can I can make sure what it what you wanted is on the agenda. Okay. And any I mean, we have a list of, of possible uh, presentations by county staff um, that uh, you know that we look over when we do the agenda. So, um, but if anybody has any particular uh, issues they would like to hear from county about, um, we can see if we can get the appropriate agency to talk to us? I know that uh, Sonoma Water is doing drought presentations, so we got a little of it tonight, but if we wanted that, um, you know, maybe they would have an update on the signs too at that point. Okay, yeah, let's put that as a possibility. And also just, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but Permit Sonoma is coming um, July 21st to give kind of the more, the more in-depth um, 
you know, Glen Ellen Project's sort of informative report. Um, so, and, and I, I guess they have an online system that they're going to teach people how to use to look up um, information, so. Oh, great. All right, any other thoughts or ideas about next month's agenda? Yeah, Council Member Newhouser. Well, I know it's late, but um, uh, I, I wanted to mention that in my role as liaison to the Glen Ellen Forum Projects uh, Committee, um, that, that we had a very interesting uh, development um, regarding the, uh, what, is, what we're calling the Firehouse Triangle. Um, and I, we can talk about it next time, but it's, uh, it could end up being a drive-through ballot box. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So anyway, it's it's very interesting. Um, you throw your ideas out there, and <laughs> lo and behold, it becomes a magnet for other ones. So um, anyway, so it's a very very interesting situation, and uh, quite complicated for such a small parcel. Do you want to, you know, we have usually on the, the uh, ad hoc reports, you know, we try to limit it to I think three minutes or something. Do you mm -hmm. want to, should we assume it's going to take a little bit longer for that item? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, there's not a whole lot more, but, um, but, but yeah, no, we could do that. Yeah. Okay. We'll give you five, five minutes and 39 seconds. Keep it three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, well, I um, get the sense that we're good. If you have any other ideas, uh, email them to Ariel and then Damon and Ariel and I, and I will sit down and craft our next agenda. And um, I think we did pretty well tonight. We got a lot of information and um, it was good to see the county staff uh, just to get, made me feel very connected with, with the county, which was good. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Art. Right. Thanks, everybody. So it is now 7.59. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Why not? All right. <laughs> motion and to adjourn. Second. second. All right. Uh, all in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All right. Looks unanimous. All right. Thanks, everybody. Aye. Thank you, Arthur, and everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ariel and Hannah. Alyssa. Bye, guys. And thanks, Alyssa.